Well, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tank Talk Podcast. Yes, it is the number one aquarium podcast on earth. Very happy to have you here. Jason Adams from Primetime Aquatics, John Hudson from KG Tropicals, and KeepFishKeeping.com. Thanks for being here. What do we have in store for us today? Well, you know, you thought a couple weeks ago it wasn't enough to uh, spark controversy talking about Amazon, even though that was my idea, but I can still blame you. Uh, today, you've decided to mix things up, and we're going to cover quite possibly one of the largest controversial controversies in the fishkeeping world, which would be Glowfish. I'm excited Absolutely. about this one. And what's cool is it really kind of is a continuation. A couple weeks ago, we did the episode on wild caught versus tank raised fish. And I thought it would be a natural, a nice natural progression to talk about other types of fish and whether or not we should be keeping them and what it means to the aquarium hobby. But before we get into that, I do want to thank, we want to thank Fritz Aquatics, fritzaquatics.com. They are a channel sponsor of the Tank Talk podcast, and they are because we both use their products a lot in our fish rooms. They have great stuff everywhere from water conditioners to water testing equipment, the top end medications for your fish, whether it's ick or bacterial or fungal infections. Definitely worth checking them out at fritzaquatics.com and you on keepfishkeeping.com have Fritz Aquatics products there as well. So if you're looking for the best in the industry, you really can't go wrong with Fritz Aquatics. I want to thank them once again for supporting the Tank Talk podcast. Now, we've been doing something new as well, right? Mm -hmm. And that is news that you can use when it comes to the aquarium hobby. And I think the big news lately has been that AquaClear has released a new filter. And I did a review on this filter a few weeks ago. Feel free to check it out if you want. I reviewed the Fluval AquaClear AC50. And it, they do have some changes coming up to these filters. Have you had a chance to take a look at them just yet? I have. Uh, I, too, was sent them, uh, and I was very excited. I don't want to spark any more controversy here, but maybe not as excited as I wanted to be because of one thing, but... That doesn't mean it's not a good filter. They have definitely made improvements. Uh, not all the improvements that I wanted to see, but uh, I still think it is a banger. Listen, this is one of the best hang on the back filters as far as sales go. Uh, and, and it's not even close. I mean, I, I think it's, it's been, on, been around for 40 years, the same design. And a lot of people would say, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And Fluval definitely held on to that for quite some time but they knew that there were some things that needed improving and they did improve those things i commend them for that i too will be having a video come out i don't know exactly when it's going to come out but i uh i have mine running now and i'm going to be i'm going to be doing a video about that and i'm excited about it so yeah big deal big deal for the fish keeping industry yeah and i've got one right now it's running on our 50 gallon low boy, our, our multi shell dweller tank. And those filters, those hang on backs on that tank, get a workout with all the sand that's flying around, an overstock tank, a big footprint because it's four feet. This is the AC50, which is, it's really designed for like that 20 to 29 gallon tank. But I got on the 50 low boy, there's sponge filters in there as well. But it's so far, and I've only had it up and running now for about, well, at the time you're watching this, it'll be three or four weeks. But at the time of recording, it's been about a week or so. And it's, it's doing a good job. It's pushing water through like the old ones do. So it'll be interesting. Usually I will follow up in anywhere from six to 12 months and do a long-term review. Uh, so far, so good. We'll see how it holds up on that tank because it, it's going to get a workout. It's being, it's on a volume where it's really not designed to handle 50 gallons. And I don't need it to because I've got the sponge filters, but I wanted to really put it through its, its paces here and it's getting it. You are a source that I, I respect very much your opinion on things. Uh, I Unfortunately, I'm a huge fan of yours, but I had a rather busy weekend over the weekend. I saw that you put that video up, but I didn't get a chance to watch it yet. What were your first impressions? Were, are, you, are they favorable or are you concerned or how do you feel about it? Oh, so if you're a fan of the AquaClear, you're probably going to be a fan of this filter. There's no doubt about it. It's got a longstanding history of being a filter that is fairly reliable. And I would say that they have, they've, 
they've been careful, right? So you want to make sure that you keep all the things that have worked in the past and make some improvements. I, I would consider this to be the Toyota way of improving a product, right? Toyota doesn't come out and just be like, boom, here's something all new from the ground up. Every single thing has been completely and totally revamped. What you do like is you take land. something that has been reliable for a really long time and then you tweak it to make it better. And I would say that that is what they've done. And the tweaks that they've made are noticeable. They're substantial. And as long as the quality is there, which was why we do the long term test, that's why you have it on your aquarium right now. It's why I'm running it. If it if the reliability is there, I think that there are going to have some meaningful changes. And the big question is, you know, pricing, if the pricing is similar to their competitors, they're going to have a really good filter on the market. Well, I can speak on that because uh, I've been in communication with Fluval about it. It will be competitive as far as the pricing goes. Uh, my first impressions were, I, I wish they, they made that one big change, but yeah. I knew they weren't going to make that change before I even received it because I had a meeting with my guy at Fluval and, uh, and he told me then, you know, he was like, I know you're going to be disappointed because we didn't move the pump into the aquarium. Uh, but I think you're going to be happy with the improvements. And it's true. I, I am. I, I think they made a lot of really good improvements. I'm, I'm thrilled with how they redesigned the uptake tube uh, mm -hmm. being more of an arc instead of that boxy kind of thing. Right. Um, I love that, to my knowledge, they're the only one including a pre-filter on there, which I think yes. is great. Uh, and I love the new configuration of the media in the back. It, it's They made a lot of really good improvements, improvements to the lid too, which was a big complaint for me. I'm excited about it. I, I think they did good things. Um, it's not perfect because there's no such thing as the perfect filter. Uh, but I think they, they made a lot of really good steps in the right direction. And I think we'll be looking at this filter probably for the next 40 years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So in today's episode, we are going to be talking about glowfish. Are they good? Are they bad? And the reason this topic came up is the last couple times, probably two or three times Aquashella has run. I think it was Marine. No, actually glowfish had a booth. I think it was associated with Marine land and they had a big, a couple of big displays, like 125 gallon tanks. And I took some video of that. I've put it out on YouTube shorts. And I did a video about Glowfish a long time ago. Again, this was like three or four years ago. Are they good? Are they bad? We went over a lot of the details and I thought it would be an awesome topic for us today to kind of revisit because when I did those videos from Aquashella, a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, Glowfish are hideous. In fact, I think that topic is probably like my number one viewed YouTube short. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I asked people, hey, do you keep them? And it's a lot of people do keep these fish. So I absolutely recognize that. But lately, what's the big, what's the one? Because you mentioned it before when we were talking earlier today. There's one glowfish out there that is really standing out lately. It's the game changer. It, it takes it from, uh, you know, just a, a, a few little common fish that they've altered and, and made into these glowfish. But they have made one of the titans maybe I shouldn't say Titan because it's not, they're not huge, but one of the most popular fish in the hobby, the freshwater angelfish. They've made a glowfish version of that. I've got to see them. Uh, I'm sure you did too. They, I'm sure they had them there at Aquashella. Yeah. Um, I got to see them at a store and I got to say, they're really cool. <laughs> they they're look stunning. really neat. And I think they're, of all the glowfish that I've seen, they are probably one of the most semi-natural looking fish. So when I did the last YouTube short on the glow angel fish, the light that they had on the tank was actually, it was, well, I don't know if it was supposed to be, but when I turned it on before anybody got there, it was cycling through from regular white light to different colors to the, like the, the black light that really shows off the fish. And even just with regular light, that those fish were really popping, but they weren't extreme, right? So when you had the whatever been the skirt tetras or the Daniels, sometimes they look so glowy that they just they don't look natural, right? The rainbow shark that they did as a glow fish, it doesn't look supernatural, but those angel fish, even without the special lights, it's like those are really pretty. 
Yeah, I was going to say the the tank that I saw them in, uh, they were there was like four or five of them in there. They were all the pink variety. There weren't uh, any other colors. And they were just on regular aquarium daylight lights. Mm -hmm. And they looked spectacular. They didn't look like little pieces of neon floating around. They looked like a pink fish. And it was a yep. super bright pink fish. And I was like, whoa, like that's the first time I've seen a glowfish where I was like, I could, I could see keeping those. I'm not gonna, but I, I could see that. I mean, they're, they're really magnificent. It was a, a surprise. So a question for you, when you viewed those fish, when you saw them, how big were they? The angels? Um, yeah. They were a quarter size. The okay. body, the body was a quarter size. Yeah. So the first time I saw them, they were about like a 50 cent piece. They had glow angels at the last aquashella in chicago that were huge i mean they were big they were not quite the the body not quite the size of paul in my hand but they were getting pretty close wow so th that told me a couple things one these fish are and same with the other ones that have been around for a while they are getting pretty close to a normal life size fish right a normal max size fish and were ridiculously healthy. I mean, they, you could just see their fins were erect and the males are kind of like, you know how they do that where they kind of hit the, the underbody of the sure. other angels just to kind of show dominance, nothing like yep. overly aggressive, just kind of push them back into a certain area. These fish, they would come up to the glass and they were like shaking their fins. You know how angel fish do <laughs> like, you want to go? You want to go? What's up? And I'm like, I'm a human being, man. What do you think you're going to do? I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to bite you. So they were, they had a, all the personality of an adult angel fish and they were very, very striking. So uh, when it comes to these glow fish, I, we've kind of mentioned this, but there's lots of varieties. Now I think was the skirt Tetra pretty much, or was it the Daniel was the first one that probably came out, right? I can't remember I, which one. I feel like it was the skirts. I, I don't, I, I, that's, I, I feel like that was where they kind of came up with it. I could be wrong, but it's the first one I remember seeing anyway. So we've got the skirt tetras, the Danios, the rainbow sharks, the angel fish, the beta, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't see as much anymore. I, I can't remember. I don't frequently go into like the pet co's and pet smarts, but when they first came out, there was like a big display for them. And I haven't, I don't remember seeing them anymore. So I'm not sure if the, and maybe somebody here can comment if the glow beta is still a thing, but I don't, I don't know. Do you know? I haven't seen them in a while, but there's one thing I know with, and I could say without even any thought is that beta people are, or beta people, if I want to say it properly, uh, they are not people to be messed with. And yeah. I think that uh, maybe they may have like put such a hurting on it that they decided to slow down or something, or maybe they just couldn't produce them fast enough. I don't know. I just but. don't think for those ones they could sell because they were really expensive. And yeah. then that's the one fish was like, that's the worst possible fish to turn into a glow fish because they are naturally gorgeous fish, just full of different color. Mm -hmm. And when you just make it a lime green fish, you're like, well, wait a minute, all those natural ones for like 20% of the cost are way prettier than this this globe beta is so i'm i'm sure there was an economic perspective and there's other things that we'll talk about later that i'm sure went into that i don't know if i'm imagining it or if it actually happened were there glow cory cats i'm gonna look it up real fast i thought i saw glow cory cats and maybe i'm just maybe joanna put that in my brain i don't recall ever seeing those but i i gotta be honest while you're looking that up i gotta bring up a a little sidebar here, something that is just completely distracting me and making it very difficult for me to, to do this episode. I'm sitting in front of my 360 gallon aquarium that has three bikers, three Oscars, a Severum and a, a easily 24 inch long Pleco in it. And any of y'all that are watching this or listening to this that are considering getting a common Plecostomus, let me tell you about something that they do that is, uh, it's just horrifying. They, they hold on to their poops for a long time. I'm sitting <laughs> yeah. here. I'm not kidding you, Jason. It's directly behind the camera. So every time I look at the camera, I'm seeing this. My Pleco is sitting on the substrate and he has a piece of poop hanging out of himself. That is literally, I could turn the camera around and show you extending all the way up to the top of the tank. Oh my gosh. It's a 24 inch tall tank. It is a 24 inch line of plecostomus poop that is just giving me nightmares as I'm sitting here 
talking to you right now. It's yeah, you should anyway. frame that. Take it out. <laughs> You know, I'll tell you what I'm going to do it. while we're, while we're sitting here, I'm going to take a short video of it. All right. With my gonna phone, gotta... I'm going to show it to everybody. I'm going to put it over top of me as we're talking. You can see it. It is nightmare fuel is what this is. It's like so a piece of spaghetti. We're taking a anyway. short commercial break to see <laughs> Placostomus poopies. Uh, I did look it up, by the way. There are glow quarry cats. I wasn't going crazy. I thought I saw them somewhere, and sure enough, they are lime green quarries. Okay. Again, probably not something that I personally would want because a lot of the quarry cats have such cool patterns. I could see why people would want them, but if I were going to rank them, I think the angelfish are definitely the coolest in terms of what they've done with them, followed by maybe the rainbow sharks. That's kind of an interesting one because they've got different colors, like a purple and a lime and an orange. But besides all that, did you want to show your your picture of the the? Pleco oh no, poop? I'm just gonna I'm gonna have to edit it onto there. I'll I'll just Got put it, it in okay. editing. <laughs> so you've already shown it potentially right now. It's like now pleco poop. Yep, those uh, people saw what I'm talking about. <laughs> so one of the things that I think people are hesitant about when it comes to glowfish, and we don't, we're not sponsored by glowfish or the company or anything like that. This is just a subject we decided to talk about obviously is the fact that they are unnatural and that is 100% true fact these fish in nature they are not glowing if you shine a, <laughs> a black light on them that's just not what these fish will do but the misconception is that somehow these fish are dyed right they're using a dye that they inject into the fish and that's how you're getting this color and that is 100% false are there fish out there where there is a dye? Yeah, the parrotfish come to mind where you see the purples and the, you know, all those crazy colors. Yeah, that's an injectable dye. That's how they do that sometimes. And that dye wears off and it's not great for the fish as you could imagine. But for these glowfish, that's not what's going on. What they're doing is they're inserting a gene into the fish's genome. And then when the fish have babies, that gene is passed down and you have little glowfish babies. And I know this because even though, and by the way, to be very clear, it is illegal to breed glowfish. So let's just state that from the start. If you get glowfish and you breed them on purpose and sell them, you are violating their patent. So be really careful with that. But and I they have are seen strict. People, yeah, they, they are. Yeah, you don't yep. want to mess around. I don't know how they're going to do that with the angelfish. So the other fish were not easy to breed, right? So your skirt tetras, your danios, your quarry cats, not that they're hard to breed, but you almost kind of sort of had to try in some ways to breed them. It wasn't like you're usually just going to find a ton of fish. With these glow angels, people who have kept angels know they're not that hard to breed. So I, right. I have a hard time believing they're going to be able to control that. I think at some point in the near future, there's going to be glow angels everywhere because people are just going to have these angel fish. They're going to get a pair provided that they're, and I don't know the details that there are both males and females out there and that they have all the fertility of normal angel fish, which I also don't know for sure. But if they do, there's going to be a ton of those fish out there. But the point here is the gene is inserted within the genome and that gene is just passed down. And to the best of my knowledge for most of the glow fish, that gene is not interfering with other genes. It's changing the pigmentation of those fish to be sure, but it's not generally having an impact on other physiological features of that fish. And I know at least in terms of longevity and health, we've had the skirt tetras and the Daniels in, at various times, not necessarily that we went out and bought them on purpose. I don't know how they wind up in the fish room, but from time to time they do, they seem to grow just as large, live just as long, and have the generally speaking the same behaviors as the wild type fish. Yeah, I I got to be truthful with you. I've never kept them, uh, yeah. but I do know people who have, and I've heard the same things that you wouldn't know. It's not like there's obvious ill effects from the genetics that you know makes them disposable fish or anything like that. So, yeah, I I can second that, but not from my own personal experience. Yeah. The only exception to that are the bettas. And I said, hey, you know what? One of the reasons why I don't think, and again, I, they might still be out there. Again, comment if you know for sure. I just haven't seen them, but I also am not like looking like, oh, where's the glow betta display? <laughs> but there were a couple issues there. One, they were crazy expensive. And two, I remember hearing from Kasha from Creative Pet Keeping. She had one. She's like, it went blind within like six weeks, like straight oh, up wow. blind. 
I'm like, oh, that's weird. That's something I'll watch out for. And then we had one. And sure enough, inside of eight weeks, ours was blind as well. So wow. that is one case where I don't know if it was where the gene was inserted or maybe there was a feedback mechanism within the, the physiology of the fish where it was causing the bettas in particular to lose their eyesight. Again, I, I haven't seen that in the skirt tetras and then the daniels and certainly those angel fish that were at the display at aquashella were large they probably to be that size i would imagine they were at least a year old and i didn't see any issues with those angel fish because like i said they were all up in your face doing all the angel fish things but the better i know from personal experience and from hearing it from kasha as well and that's weird right i mean if you it's anecdotal to be sure so it's not like oh if my Meta went blind, then they're all going to go blind. But right. mine did, so did hers. And it's kind of interesting that we went 0 for 2. Maybe that was an early thing where they had a gene inserted into a location where, yeah, it's causing problems. If they could reinsert that gene somewhere else, maybe that problem goes away. I don't know. I don't know the specifics of where they're inserting that gene and how they're doing it. But that was the one case where it was like, yeah, the, there, there's some issues there. Yeah, I mean, if you told me Kasha had one and it went blind after eight weeks, I'd be like, well, you know, I mean, the the breeding of betas has become so prevalent and they're, they're breeding so many of them that a lot of them are known for having tumors and they're known for these these health defect, uh, defects that and that, you know, maybe that was just one of them. But for you to have one right after that and do the same thing, that is what I call a pattern. And I don't know that that's one that I would like to see. Uh, there's nothing I, more sad than a blind fish. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's even a blind dog. You can get by with that. Like, okay, they can hear your voice and you can right. guide them around. Guiding a blind fish becomes much more difficult. Because what we wound up being able to do is we were able to feed the fish, almost kind of hold the food in a location, and the fish would just kind of get be guided to that area. But it wasn't long before it started losing weight and it eventually died. The, the fish, both mine and hers, they started to get thin and just, they didn't look particularly good. So obviously that's an issue. And I, I get the main argument of it not being natural and not being something that would be included in a natural tank. So many people, even beginners, often they're looking at a tank that's got some natural aspect, like, oh, I'm going to add some rocks and some wood and some plants. And then you've got these fish here that are very much unnatural in the sense that the colors are very different from the other fish. So I understand that argument. I think that's for the most part what I have seen the main argument is it's an unnatural fish it's carrying unnatural genes and so why would you want to have it in your tank yeah I mean it's not my main argument but I'll get into my main argument uh, against glowfish later but um, different strokes for different folks you know what I mean you know some people like cars that are painted bright purple. I like cars that are black or white. I mean, you know, uh, but when we talk about the, 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 if there is health effects from it, like betas, they go blind. That to me is a crossing the line kind of thing that, and maybe that's why you don't see them anymore. Maybe that was a problem, a prominent problem that was experienced by a lot of people. Uh, if it was having those kind of health, of health effects, I would be more against them than I am now, but I got to be honest, I really haven't heard those things until today. Uh, sitting here with you, I, I hadn't really heard of a lot of um, ill effects from this as far as long-term health of the fish. I've always thought they were normal. They're just neon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you said you had a main con. What is that main? Do you want me to get thing? into that right away? Just come yeah, right yeah, out with no, it, huh? No, bring okay. it, bring it. My, I think that the one of the number one mistakes in fish keeping is entering this hobby on impulse. It is being at the fish store, mom's there buying cat food for the cats and little, little one is with them, with her and says, mommy, look at that. I want a beta. I want a goldfish. I want this. I want that. And without any thought just to appease the little one, Mom says, okay, let's do it. They got this complete kit. They take it home. They set it up. All the fish die a month later. The kids lose interest and they're out. I, I, that's the biggest problem. Some of those people buy fish on impulse and become lifelong fish keepers like us. But I think the majority of them end up killing all the fish 
they're excited about it for a week and then they lose interest and and they bail out and the fish suffer for it and i don't think there is a more appealing fish for a child to buy on impulse than a glowfish now i want to be very clear i am not in any way opposed to children getting involved in this hobby in fact i wish they all would i think it's great for teaching them responsibility and uh, taking care of an animal is one of the best ways to do that i think it's great and if we lose children coming into this hobby we lose this hobby so i am not in any way against children getting into this hobby but what i want to see is children getting involved in it the right way mommy i want that okay tyler we'll get that for you however we're not going to get it today we're going to you're going to learn about that you're going to learn how you need to take care of it you're going to do all the research and then we'll come back and get it as long as you know what you're doing with it that's the way to do it if they do it right buy glowfish buy i don't care what you buy that that's fine but buying them on impulse and i this is the main complaint i have with glowfish is that i believe this is what they're targeting is people to buy the fish on impulse and all that does is lead to tanks on Craigslist for sale and a bunch of dead fish and or not Craigslist, but Facebook marketplace. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's a huge problem. That is my main complaint. My main complaint has nothing to do with the health of the fish or the way they look it has everything to do with the wrong people buying them. And you get that, that tank on Facebook marketplace. Not only do you get the five gallon tank, but all the colored gravel and fluorescent plants. <laughs> and right. here's the light that, and that was one thing that people had asked. And, and I, based on observation, I didn't think it was necessarily a problem, but the color of that light itself is so unnatural. Is it having an impact on the fish as well? And I, I, I really couldn't answer that scientifically other than to say, well, when we've kept fish with that color light, it didn't seem to have a negative impact, but I could absolutely see somebody doing some more research and saying, yeah, it does. But you just spark something in my brain that I didn't have planned to talk about, but I think it's one of the most important things now because you're right. Glowfish appeal to children. It is a attempt to get children into the hobby, which I commend the attempt to get children into the hobby, whether or not this is the right way to do it is an absolutely viable counter argument. But here's another issue. Let's go back to the beginning of our conversation about the fish that are now glowfish. Daniels, skirt tetras, quarry cats, rainbow sharks, angelfish. There could be some other ones, and I just forgot what they are. Now think about the kits that they are using. Usually, not always, it's a 5 or 10-gallon glowfish kit. I don't recall, and maybe there are 20-gallon glowfish kits out there. There very well could be. I doubt that is what people are generally buying because nobody who's buying fish on impulse are like, let me go and buy this glowfish kit for a 20 gallon. That's going to be a lot of money. Now let's tie that back into the types of fish that they've turned into glowfish, assuming, and I think rightfully so, that most of those fish are geared towards children. Angelfish, minimum tank size. For me, probably a 55 gallon, right? Agreed. Full height of the angel fish. You could make an argument, maybe a 40 breeder, but really long-term, at least a 55 gallon. That's, and it's a cichlid. This is not a beginner fish. Right. Rainbow shark. Oh my gosh. Could you think of a fish that is less of a beginner fish than a freaking rainbow shark? Those things <laughs> will destroy everything. You put that thing in a 20 or 29 gallon and come back to me in a couple of years and tell me which fish you can keep with that thing in a 20 or 29 gallon. And that's assuming that they even have those setups at that size. Most of them are five to 10 gallons. Those fish should have nothing to do with a tank that small. And usually again, 40 breeder, 55 gallon, give them their space, give them their areas so that they're not terrorizing other fish and other bottom dwellers. So those two are absolutely a no go for kids and they're not beginner fish. They're very difficult to manage long term for beginners, but even the black skirt tetra, those fish get big. I saw mm -hmm. those fish when I did the species profile, I used a 3000 gallon tank from Wonders of Wildlife in Springfield, Missouri. And those fish were every bit three inches and they were big and bulky and tall. They're fin nippers. This is a horrible fish to put in a, a group in a 20 gallon, not to mention the fact that most people are like, oh, give me three of those or four of those. They're going to beat the snot out of each other. They're going to start fin nipping your guppies and all the other beginner fish that you get. Those 
better off in a 40 breeder or a 55 gallon long term in a big group of 8, 10, 12, 15 or more. So now it's like most of the fish that they're creating have no business being in a lot of the tanks that they sell. Now you're left with Cory fish, Cory cats and the Danios. Those are fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Cory cats, you can provided that they're healthy. And again, I don't know anything about the Cory cats. The Daniels seem to be fine. We had the glow Daniels in a 10 gallon. They just zip back and forth like regular Daniels for years. It was, it was fine, but I think they're going on the, on a bad path because they're not focusing as much on the fish that would be gateway entry level, small fish to keep in the aquariums that are glow fish aquariums. And now they're going off on this, this route where who's, what experienced fish keeper is looking at the glow rainbow shark and saying, I'm going to add that to my 75 gallon. I mean, none. And, and, and again, I, I would slightly disagree with you about the angels. I, I agree a hundred percent on the tank size, but I think well, that, the angels. Yeah. That's why I didn't mention the angels. Cause I think you could get experienced fish keepers on the angels. Well, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, I, I disagree about angels being bad for beginners, except mm. for the fact the tank size is what I meant. Yeah, the tank size. Yeah, I mean yeah. they're super easy to keep as long as yes. you can keep the aggression under control. Um, right. the, so they're great for beginners. If a beginner is starting with a fifty-five gallon tank, right. nobody is gonna like you said. Nobody's gonna go in and buy a twenty gallon on impulse, let alone a fifty gallon. And I've always attributed glowfish to smaller ten gallon maybe 15, but five, 10. And so I've always looked at it as geared towards kids. I gotta be honest, I had never even really considered that until about the angels, until you just brought it up. That is so true. I've never seen a large tank, one that would be suitable for angels. That's a glowfish tank. I've never seen that. So yeah, I wonder what their rebuttal to that is. And I wonder what made them choose the fish that they did i mean i totally get it the angels and the danios and corys but why white skirts or or black skirts or whatever it is you know yeah. why why did, is it something to do with their difficult to breed because that's not the case with angels or corys yeah i don't know i'd like to understand why wouldn't you go with something maybe the 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 glow stuff doesn't affect certain fish the same way it does others yeah. like I don't know, but I'd love to know why they chose those particular fish. My guess is the Daniel is a model organism in the sciences. So there's a ton and I mean a ton of research out there about their reproduction and their development and it's their genetics, ridiculous amounts of research because a lot of scientists, when they're just studying model organisms, they use the Daniel. I would venture to guess the, the other types of tetras that they've used, same thing, really easy to manipulate. And I think it makes sense because you're using a fish that's an egg scatterer and they're going to produce a ridiculous number of fry. So when it comes to maximizing your productivity and getting product out the door, crazy cheap, man, let your Tetras, let your Daniels just breed like absolutely crazy. You're going to get a ton of fish at almost no cost where now that's interesting because that's not the case really with the angel fish. I mean, yeah, they produce a lot of fry, but not like an egg scatterer does and not as easily. There's more parental care involved. Right. I mean, yeah, you can tumble the eggs and all that stuff, but there's still, there's more care there. So I would imagine with the rainbow sharks, you still have some, some consideration there. The, the Cory cats, again, there's a little bit more to deal with there. I'm surprised in some ways they didn't go guppies, platies, so still community, but they're live bears. Now they do breed pretty readily, but maybe there's some hindrances there with the fact that they're live bears. Maybe that gene's not as stable. Maybe there's some interference there, but that would be at least fish size. Endlers would be perfect to me. So you do endlers and guppies, but then you could make the argument, well, male guppies naturally are probably going to be more pretty than the glowfish version, unless they can mix some of those that finage and somehow keep some of that pigment and still get the glow gene to show itself in the rest of the body. Uh, other small fish like the rasboras, I would say are probably, they're so, I wouldn't say frail, but they do have some fragility that some of the Tetras and Daniels don't have. So maybe you start inserting genes there, just getting them transported out and distributed. That might be an issue. So my guess is there's, there's still somewhat limited to fish that where they feel like they're pretty hardy but yet can reproduce enough to make it 
economically viable, but at the same time, they're losing focus on what is their target audience. It really like come to think of it. There's, there are no live bears. I mean, it must be a live bear thing. Cause like for me, if I'm Mr. Glow and I'm creating this, I'm, I would feel like the solid color mollies, platies, I feel like they would show the glow the best, you know? Yeah. But maybe it is a, a live bear thing, which takes those out and guppies and endlers and all of that. Maybe that, that is something uh, in the, in the science behind it that live bears won't, won't reproduce that glow gene. I don't know, but yeah. it, it, that's another thing that just occurred to me that there's no such thing to my knowledge as live bearer glowfish. Right. And then you have to think, okay, well, how many species do you really want to do this with? Because let's just say you've got the glow Daniel, you know, it's an easy fish to breed. You know, it's an easy fish to distribute. Why would you make a small glow neon at that point? Well, it's like, you're going to get the same colors. It's a slightly different body shape. But if you're a consumer, like, well, I've got the glow Daniel here and I've got this glow Tetra there. They have the same similar size. They're a little bit body shape wise, but the beginner's not going to care about that. So why not just rely on the glow Daniel for the smaller fish and the skirt Tetra is a little bit larger from that point. I don't know from a market perspective at that point, you're just messing with genetics just to make as many glow fish varieties as you can. But I think there's the law of diminishing returns. Once you've overlapped on size and overall behavior of the fish, like, Oh, here's your Daniel. It's a schooling fish. It's small. Here's your skirt tetra. It's a schooling fish. It's a little bit larger. You can keep them together. At that point, you've covered all your schooling fish from the size of a Daniel to the size of a skirt tetra. No need to mess with any other genetics of any other fish. But I guess the Cory cat, that makes sense. Like logically, if I'm thinking like glowfish aquarium, perfect. I've got my bottom dwellers, my scavenger fish, small ish, although you could make a really, they don't belong in a five gallon. You could make a strong argument that a full grown Cory cat kept in groups, a 10 gallon is probably not ideal, but you'd want at least a 20 gallon there. The rainbow shark and the angel fish make no sense at least in terms of consumer, unless you're a, an adult that just looks at that glow fish is like, I like it. Forget the glow aspect, but I just like the way it looks. And that's something I would include in my tank. And I could see people doing that. Well, you know, and maybe it's, I don't even know how to say this, but maybe if you think about, there's a lot of people that are not interested in the natural thing. And yeah. so maybe what their target audience is with the angels and, and the rainbow sharks for that matter is the adults, you know, it's yeah. like, Hey, we've got the little Daniels that are zipping around, which I believe if I was Mr. Glow again, and I was like, okay, we can only pick one fish to make glow fish. It would be the Daniel because yeah. to me, they're, they're bulletproof. Anybody can keep them. They stay small and they're all over the place. They're one of the most entertaining fish that you're going to watch. So that's the perfect fish for appealing to the kids, but for the adults that are the ones that are, they have the money, you know, maybe, maybe that was to like, they're looking at it like, okay, we've got the kids now we've duped them into this. Uh, that was a little harsh, but I meant every word <laughs> I said, but now my Pleco has the poop tangled up all around him. This is getting ridiculous, nice. but uh, now maybe we want to appeal to the adults and bring yeah. the adults into the, the glow world and uh you know they you know what i'm surprised that they haven't done and maybe they're gonna do this speaking of adults don't you say it don't act, you do it don't i'm you gonna say, say it. it and you know what i'm gonna say yeah i hope you're not a large yo yeah i'm gonna glow oscars you know oh, how dare say. you <laughs> <laughs> I, well all right so imagine this because it would be interesting i mean they're a huge fish with a great personality you get a 180 gallon tank here's Here's my setup. And I'm not saying I, 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 I wouldn't do this, but I could see why somebody <laughs> would. You get a hundred or a 240 or like a tank like you have behind you. Glow Oscars, glow convicts. As your schooling fish, glow silver dollars. <laughs> and they're all different colors. And you're going to have the silver dollars constantly shimmering. Your glow Oscars, glow convicts, super. So I'm looking at it from multiple pers perspectives, right? If I am 
the company that's, you know, Glowfish, and I'm creating these fish, Oscars and convicts have massively huge spawns, massively huge. So from a, hey, we're going to get a lot of bang for our buck here, and you want a large fish, those are going to be simple. You know how easy convicts breed, so oh God, that yeah. is going to be super simple. Silver dollars, again, that's a fish that would produce a lot of fry, and that's your schooling fish. So now you've got those. And, hey, you want to throw in a, a glow bristlenose pleco or two, there you go. <laughs> there's there's your setup, uh, and just roll with that. And I, I don't know. Uh, you, again, you would I actually some... do it? No, you, no, I would. Are, but... You are out of control, Adams. I tell you what, you're, you've lost it now. You've, you've lost the plot. No, I mean, listen, this is already a, the most abused fish in the hobby. One of both of them you mentioned, Oscars and Plecos, and you just want to make them glow. I'm not going to lie to you. I do agree. That would be a magnificent looking tank. I hope I never see it uh, as much of an Oscar coming, advocate man. as I am. I hope it, I hope I never see it, but, uh, it would be pretty cool to see. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do angel fish, take it to the next level, you know, glow convicts, glow Oscars. The only problem, just like the angel fish with the, with the convicts is you're not going to be able to maintain any level of patent control on a glow convict. Cause those things breed like oh, crazy. Yeah. They would be all over earth within yep. about a year. Right. And theoretically the Oscars too, if somebody actually wanted to take the time to breed them. So, I mean, from the glow fish perspective, and again, that's why I'm, I'm interested to i'm interested in their thought process with the angel fish because you're not controlling that right you could control to a certain extent the daniels and the skirt tetras and cory cats don't breed super out of control but angels good luck you're going to have those yeah. things all over the place and you're just you created something you invested time and effort into it and the payback after a year even if you've got the patent it's, it, it's irrelevant because everybody's going to have those fish and if they wind up with a pair and again i don't know the other thing, too, is I don't know how stable that insertion is for all species of fish. That could be another reason why we have certain types. And maybe they've tried to insert these genes in other fish, and it's just not stably producing offspring. So, uh, but if the angelfish are, you're done. You're not selling any more glow angels after. I, I keep I, Yes, it's going to still be difficult because if anybody puts glow angels or glow fish in general on the Internet for sale, you're you've infringed on patent rights and you could be in a whole lot of trouble, but I could see those things showing up just in, you know, private sales real fast. Yeah. And I mean, there's really no way anybody can control that. It's no different than just being a regular angel breeder. You're yeah. not going to stop the people from breeding them. And I would imagine if you're, you know, little Johnny that has a 55 gallon tank and you're two glow angels bred and you, took them to a club and gave them away or so what judge is going to put little Johnny in jail? I mean, it, it happened by accident. I could understand if little Johnny set up a full blown operation to produce <laughs> these, but come on. Yeah. I mean, you know, who's going to do that, but, right. uh, but yeah, good luck getting the, keeping the breeding under, under control. And I, I wonder you, you touched on it. You would understand the science behind it more than me. I wonder how, how many generations it keeps going or like there's certain like OB peacocks, you know, OB peacocks will breed with each other, but they're not going to mm -hmm. produce the same fry as what the parents are because of the special selective way that the breeders do what they do. It makes me wonder if that happens here too. Like if the angels do breed, they're not going to yeah. be glow angels that come out of it. I, I don't know. Well, the in theory, they should be, right? So in theory, at least from what I've I've seen with the Tetras and the Daniels, you breed those fish, you're getting glow, glow fry. So okay. I would think that the angels would too, but the biology behind the genetics is there are mutations that accumulate in genes. So I wonder how many generations that takes to accumulate genes in the glow genes to the point where, okay, they were glowy when we first got them. Our F1s were really glowy, but as <laughs> generations progressed, they became less intense and to the point where they were some other color or not necessarily some other color, but kind of reverted back to a wild type. Again, I don't know how stable that gene is. Uh, I do know that in our microbiology classes, we actually can make E. coli grow. We, it's called P-GLOW, where we insert a gene that is 
really derived from, and I, I don't know if they're using the same gene for the glowfish. I didn't do the research. Maybe I should have before this podcast, but it was just an idea that popped into my head the day before we started shooting the video. But <laughs> in the microbiology world, we have a, a P glow gene that comes from saltwater organisms, and we can insert that into E. coli and make it glow green under UV light. Now, not this is different because these these fish are glowing under black light, which is not UV, but that, that technology is out there. So I'm familiar with gene insertion and how that happens, but I don't know the stability of that gene long term. So we, you fantasized a little bit about the Oscars again, how dare you, yeah. uh, and the convicts and the silver dollars, but, but let's go back to reality here. What's next? What's the next realistic Glowfish. What's next is feeding your glow Oscars glow Daniels. Boom. <laughs> now their stomachs are glowing. Their poop, like your pleco, glow poop. <laughs> You'll, Can you imagine? That would actually make it so that it's not like so bad. It'd be like, okay, there's a lot of yellow and orange and purple <laughs> fecal matters, but they're glowing. So whatever, I'll get to it when I get to it. Nitrate levels will spike. Glow algae, boom. You've got a whole glow <laughs> ecosystem. Glow plant. Why haven't they done glow plants? Well, because they can't absorb the light if they're glowing. That's probably why. But And they got the plastic ones. We could up our game here. Glow algae, you. glow feeder fish. It's game on. <laughs> uh, but you asked a question. What was the question? Oh, what was next? <laughs> yeah, In the what, land of what's, glow the, world? what's the next fish that you can see them making glow? Again, if they do discus... The if they do discus or Oscars, I'm showing up to their offices. Yeah, Oscars I could see just because Oscars are cheap, readily available, super easy to breed. There is no point in doing discus because it would be a bigger flop than the Globettas because natural discus and the line bred discus are gorgeous fish. Why on earth? They're expensive, right? And they're going to be expensive to breed. They're going to be expensive to ship. There's, I seriously doubt there'd ever be a glow discus. I mean, they could do it maybe. But why? Why would you want to? I think the market isn't there. They're not going to because they don't want to deal with me. That's why they're not going to That's right. It. That's right. <laughs> uh, what's next in the land of glow? I have no idea. I, when I saw that, I remember originally we were at Aquatic Experience in 2019, I believe, when I saw the first glow sh rainbow sharks. And I was like, huh, that's pretty interesting. But it would have to be something that stays in a community tank. I really think some of the live bears would make the most sense if they're going to do that. Even like the Florida least killifish, like I said, endlers, small fish, fish that you could legitimately say, hey, these can go in one of our glow fish setups without being overcrowded. Even the guppies, maybe, because you could still put those in a 10 gallon. But I, but I don't know with the live bear situation, if that is something that is is possible well let me ask you this because i have to admit i would be intrigued by this and i don't even know if it's possible because i don't know enough about them you know way more than me wouldn't a glow shrimp be really cool that actually would be pretty interesting yeah that would be that would be that would be something or a glow snail Especially if you could get it to, I mean, the shell's probably not going to glow. So then it would just be the body that's glowing. But still, yeah, wow, that's glow shrimp. I mean, I, hadn't I, considered that. I don't know how they make these fish grow, glow. I don't know how it all happens. I know, I know there's the stories of the injected fish that yeah. were put in waterways to determine water flow patterns and, and, uh, and yeah. what is it like contaminations in the water and stuff like that. That's kind of where the original idea came from. I, I understand all of that. I don't understand how they did it, but I don't understand how they make glowfish. Uh, so I don't even know if it's possible, but I'm not going to lie. A tank full of glowing shrimp would be really daggone cool. It would be interesting, but I think we'd have the same problem as the snails. So you could get the, the tissue to glow, but, but in shells. shrimp and snails, the shells are, they're calcium based, right? Calcium carbonate. And I, I don't, there's no way to really make that glow. I mean, unless you're using like nuclear type stuff, which <laughs> that would be bad for all involved. Let's just be clear about that. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that because we're talking about glow fish and we're just kind of messing around, just hypothesizing that we're rah, rah, everybody should have glow fish. Again, look at our fit, look at John's fish room, look at mine. We don't have them. It's just not something I'm interested in, but I certainly, it's not like I'm 
if somebody likes glowfish, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're a not serious fish keeper. You're you're crazy. You're I I get lots of comments on those like those like those shorts because I asked the question, do you keep them? And I would say it was probably 30 percent of people like, oh yeah, I kept them or have kept them or my kids have them. And so if it's something that can responsibly bring people into the hobby, but the problem is, as you've already mentioned, what's the likelihood of that? Is there better ways to do it? I guess. Is it something that I'm going to be keeping? Is it something where I'm going to be recommending it? You've never, ever, ever heard on Primetime Aquatics when somebody asks for recommendations on fish for any tank, not once on the face of the earth through all time have I ever said, oh, man, get yourself some Glow Daniels or some Glow Skirt Tetras or some Glow <laughs> Rainbow Sharks. It's never happened, probably never will. Uh, do I think the Glow Angel fish are the best ones out of what they've created? I think they are. Would I go out and buy them? unlikely because there's so many cool angel fish out there that are line bred that are awesome and for those of you who are against glowfish because of the gene insertion the question i had when i did my original video was if you're against the glowfish at what point have you crossed the line at what point when you go from a fish that's occurring in nature to a line bred fish that is now producing colors that are absolutely nothing like what's found in nature. Is that okay? Because at that point, then it's not about the natural versus unnatural. You can't make that argument anymore because the line bred fish that are, that are displaying unnatural unwild type like color are just as unnatural almost as the glowfish. The only difference is We've line bred those differences into the fish as opposed to gene insertion. Obviously the counter argument is going to be, well, we didn't artificially interfere with the genetic material by inserting a gene, but we did art through artificial selection, choose phenotypes, physical characteristics that we preferred to create a, a line bred fish to some of these fancy, all fancy guppies your bettas, your colorful discus, a certain a decent number of, of cichlids, uh, some of the OBs that we see that are some of the most gorgeous fish out there, in my opinion, when it comes to the Mbuna types, where's the line, right? How far do we take that? How far can you line breed something before you say, oh, we've taken it too far? Because if you're line breeding, I don't see, there's not a huge distinction between that and the glowfish. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't even need to talk about it. I completely second that. I mean, it, it is, I, I, like I said, my issue with glowfish has nothing to do with the, the altering of the genetics and stuff like that. That happens in fish breeding every single day. I mean, that's not a new thing. It happens in dog breeding and uh, every yeah. breeding cows so that you can produce the most meat. I mean, it, it, this is not something that's new. So I, that's not what I have a problem with. What I have a problem with is them ending up in the wrong hands. A lot of them might end up in the right hands, but I think that too many of them end up just being sacrificed to little tr Tyler's impulses. And, and I don't like that part of it. Um, and, I, you know, I've never spoken to a representative from Glowfish. I know uh, they've actually reached out through others to try to, to get a hold of me to maybe work with them on something and... I would I would have to respectfully decline for that reason, not for altering genetics and, and all of that kind of stuff. Because, again, like you said, it's it's all over the place. I mean, yeah. there's no such thing as a red pigeon discus in the Amazon. It doesn't exist. And it, it, the only reason it exists is because of breeding them selectively and stuff like that. I know it's not the same as right. glowfish, but. You know, the, they've been altering these things forever to get the well, des and, desired results. All right, so you're, you've had a lot of experience with this. Tell me what's worse, all right? What is worse right now? What is a worse situation for the hobby that people just don't seem to really address? Glowfish or what we've done to the betta? What is worse for the health of the fish? At this point, and you know better than anybody, you've got bettas out there or even better goldfish oh. you cannot tell me. i will take a million times out of a million times a glow daniel a glow anything except for the better because they go blind then i would take some of these fancy goldfish that can't I swim agree. they're laying at the bottom of their tank 
They're, they're basically just bowling balls. They've got the finish, the body types. There's all kinds of health issues with those goldfish. The bed is now where they're growing tumors after six months. Their fins are so stinking long, they can't swim. You're trying to figure out what filter to use for them. That's not natural. Go to right. nature, look at the wild bettas. They don't have these problems. Granted, they're, they're in puddles and stuff, but my goodness. I mean, when we're talking about, let's keep things in perspective. When we're talking about glow fish compared to these massive goldfish, which I'm surprised they're not glow fish, by the way, uh, these <laughs> massive goldfish that cannot swim, they can barely eat, they can't get off the ground, and bettas that have all these tumors and, and line breeding issues, which is worse. I completely agree, particularly the bubble eye goldfish, which is the most ridiculous looking man-made creation I've ever seen. And, but on my point that I've been making throughout this entire video, I had a conversation with somebody over the weekend who is the spouse of a fish keeper, not a fish keeper himself, was telling me that he was not interested in fish keeping at all until he saw a bubble eyed goldfish. And he was, he explained it to me, you know, the one with the big bubbles and the eyes are looking up in the yeah. air and he didn't buy one, but he said, that's what got him interested. And now he has a tank and he's doing his whole thing. So for that, I, I think that they're great, but, uh, but no, I completely agree. I, I think that's worse than glowfish. And may I say, you brought up a good thing. I wish they would make glow comet goldfish. I don't want to see the fancy ones. I wish they would make glow comets because you know what? Then they stand a chance of not being feeder fish. I would love to see that. Uh, plus, I'm a sucker for comets. But, you know, yeah, it, w there's it's already been taken so far with genetics that I don't know that it's really all that much of an argument that the genetic side of glowfish is the bad part. Um, right. I think it's I think it's everything else that is the problem for me personally again yeah. anybody who yeah. disagrees with me that's fine we can still be friends just like jason are jason and i are yeah. but uh but yeah i i see the other part of it as being worse yeah i think overall there are other aspects of the fish keeping hobby that are more troubling the the goldfish the fancy goldfish the, the better line breeding that's gotten way out of control with health issues hybridization right yeah. i mean you've got people who are keeping fish together especially important in the cichlid hobby People are keeping cichlids together. They're they're hybridizing now. They're getting rid of them. They're going to pet stores. They're selling these things. The pet stores are like, well, these are peacock cichlids, and then they're breeding. And so we're starting to water down the lines. As someone who's part of the Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, I know that the people who are really involved in that club, it's a concern for them because we're losing genetic lines to hybridization. Uh, that doesn't mean we can we have to ignore the glowfish issue. It doesn't mean that all those other problems are like, oh, focus there, and we can't talk about the glowfish issue. But I do think that th if we were to summarize, they need to stay with fish that are going to be easy to keep in small aquariums and not necessarily encourage people to start keeping fish, children in particular, that are going to be keeping larger fish in smaller aquariums without any real plan to move them into the right setup. Yep, I've experienced one time in my life, I, I always have to repeat this, I used to have a job going into 10 houses per day. I would see aquariums every day. One time I had a larger, it was like a 29 gallon tank full of glowfish in a customer's house uh, and it was the adult that had bought those. Um, I actually was looking around for kids and through talking to this woman, I discovered, I didn't ask her, but I discovered she didn't have children. They were hers. She bought them because she liked them. Uh, but I think that's rare. I think the majority of the people that are getting them are little Tyler's and little Caleb's and little yep, Cody's. Yep. I don't know why yep. it's all boys, but <laughs> those are the names that <laughs> I'm thinking of, but yeah. so yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Do we. This is, I mean, I don't know if you have anything more to add about the glowfish debate, but this is the time when uh, we talk about what's going on in the world of you and I, and do you got anything you want to share with the class? Uh, I think I pretty much already did with my Pleco poop. So I'm just going to let you have it. It's your episode anyway. Uh, I, I don't know that I have anything so the only thing that i have to share is you a couple episodes ago you mentioned that you went to the nationals game 
uh, a couple of, about a, well, as of the watching of this, it was about a month or so, maybe a little longer ago. I took our youngest son, Eli. He hadn't really been out on like a vacation all summer. So I was like, Hey man, let's go to Kansas city. We'll go see a Royals game. Cause I'd never been to Kauffman stadium. I've always wanted to go there. It just so happened just like you, it was a Cubs game. So I was like, sweet. <laughs> we'll go there with our Cubs gear on. It'll be awesome. Even though I, when I go to these other stadiums, I almost like to root for the home team. You know, it's a different experience. There are some teams where I just, I don't care where I just, I wouldn't root for the home team, but that was one. Atlanta I Braves. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Nationals. But anyway, Hey, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. But I actually like the Royals. I, even though they're have traditionally been a horrible team. So I was really looking forward to going there. Well, I didn't know this. So we spend, you know, we get there like the day before we finally get to the park and I'm like, oh my gosh. So this is a sold out game. I'm like, what is going on? It's the Royals. The Royals are lucky to get 10,000 people in that stadium, even this year. And I'm like, this place is packed. So we go to park and we're about a half a mile away from the stadium. I'm like, what in the world is going on? We start walking up. Now, Kauffman Stadium, we did a little bit of research. So I'm like, I told you, I'm like, it's got to be top five or six of the oldest stadiums in the major leagues right now. And sure enough, it was like number five or six, I think. Well, you've got Fenway, Wrigley, Chavez Ravine, you know, the Dodgers. And there were uh, the A's is an older stadium. And I think maybe Kauffman was next. Maybe there was one more that was a little bit older. But anyway, we start walking up to the door. And there's a line. I'm like, all right, whatever. This line, I kid you not went all the way down the parking lot, wrapped around a whole bunch of like, I don't know, little cement things. We stood in a line. It probably took us 40 to 45 minutes just to get into the stadium. Cause you were talking about how the Phillies, man, you get right in. It was a sellout mm -hmm. crowd. They are not built at Kauffman stadium to get lots of people into a stadium in a reasonable amount of time. And we got there early. Cause I wanted to go watch batting practice. I'm like, that's not happening. We barely got in there at game time. And I'm not kidding you. We got there like an hour and a half early. So after a while we get in, then I realized why. So one, it was the Cubs and Cubs, they travel well. So Chicago to KC, that's not a horrible drive. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And Can had I, I gotten there in time, you would have been the recipient of something. Oh, it was Patrick Mahomes bobblehead night oh, at a baseball man. game. <laughs> but by the time we got there, I mean, it's like the first whatever thousand fans did. Those giveaways were long gone. But I see people right. walking around like two fisting Patrick Mahomes bobbleheads. I think he was in a Royals. I don't understand what they're doing these days with those things. <laughs> so that was part of the problem. But then I was I normally am not like this, but I was cheap. And I was like, we're going to sit in the upper level. That way we get a better view of the park and all that stuff. The waterfalls. Dude, we were like six rows from the top. And that stadium is old school where you're basically looking straight down. Like you get oh, woozy, no. like dizzy. We're walking <laughs> like they, they should have probably just had ladders for when you get into the upper deck to like when you go to your seats. It, that's basically what the stairs were like. It was like climbing up a ladder. And we sit down and we're like, oh, my. And Eli is not like somebody who's like afraid of heights or anything. And he's like, Dad, this is uh, really high. I'm like, are you is it all right? He's like, it's kind of freaking me out, man. So. <laughs> A, Kauffman Stadium is cool they, with the waterfalls and everything. And the people just like in Philadelphia were wonderful. We were wearing our Cubs shirts and they were asking us all kinds of questions. And they know, I mean, it's the Royals. It's like they don't have any expectations, although this year they're pretty good, better than the Cubs actually. But really, really nice people. Stadium was, again, it's older. They weren't built for that kind of crowd. We, This is a great part. We went to go. Eli didn't have his food right when we walked in. I'm like, you sure? We're standing right here. No, no, let's wait till after the third. After the third inning, we go down there to get concessions. You know when we got back? Top of the sixth. So <laughs> it was brutal, absolutely brutal. So I would say never again will I go there on bobblehead night and oh, not man. when they're playing any team. Like that's next time if I ever go there, it's going to be like the Royals versus the A's or whatever other <laughs> team is in last place. But the A's, that's usually a pretty good guess. There'll be like 4,000 people there. It'll be a great experience. But holy cow, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, that, that brings up two things uh, that I can go ahead and do a, my own little version of John's World today, but they also have to do with John's World from last week, but you reminded me of it. For those that don't know, I collect bobbleheads. It is a thing that I'm very, very passionate about. I don't know why. It's silly little toys that they give away at baseball stadiums, but I love them. 
Uh, that's what I try to stick with is the, the stadium giveaway bobbleheads. But I have a lot of them that, are, that I've purchased that are nothing to do with baseball, like Superman, Batman, stuff like that. But anyway, uh, my game that I went to was also a giveaway day. Uh, not a bobblehead, though, but I was like, well, that's just yet another bonus. Uh, but when I said it was super easy for us to get into Citizens Bank Park, uh, it was because we showed up at the end of the first inning. So ah. most of the people were already in there and the Nats were already losing four to nothing. But we had, while we were sitting in our seats, I'm not kidding to you, two different people that came up to us and they said, hey, you're wearing a Nationals jersey, so obviously you're not Philly fans, right? And I said, yeah, that's true. Can we buy the, they were giving away the bucket hats that had the P on it. Okay. And can we buy those from you? And I was like, well, we showed up here late. We didn't get them. And the, okay, no problem. So the two different people asked us if, if they could buy our hats. Now, if we had gotten the hats, I still would have told them no, because I would have put them on my shelf with all my other stuff, even though it has that ugly P on it. But I would have still kept them. But anyway, while we were there, we actually left in the eighth inning. And I said, before we leave, let me go into the team store real quick. I want to see if they have a bobblehead that I could buy. They did. It was Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper was drafted by the Nationals not long after they came to town in number one overall pick. So I'm a fan of Bryce Harper. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy this bobblehead. That's perfect. I take it up to the counter and I, and I hand it to the gentleman who's obviously from Philly. And he's holding the box of Bryce Harper bobblehead, looking at my jersey, looking at he's looking at up and down like i don't understand what's going on here <laughs> like he's confused you're buying a phillies bobblehead yet you're wearing a nationals jersey this is weird and i said listen i collect bobbleheads he's gonna go on my shelf bryce was drafted by us and I, even though he went to the team that we all hate the most i still am a fan i still root for the guy so uh he understood then but yeah, that was interesting. This guy was totally shocked by some weirdo wearing a Nationals Jason Worth jersey wanting uh, a Phillies bobblehead. But he's on my shelf now, and he looks good. But I did throw the box away. I didn't worry about keeping the box yeah. like I do all of my other bobbleheads. But, yeah, it looks good sitting there. Nice. I've got now, I think, five Bryce Harper bobbleheads. The other four are all in Nationals uniforms, the one that he should be still wearing to this day. But... Yeah. Yep. There's yep. my John's world for today. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So everybody, again, would love to hear from you. What do you think about the glowfish? Good, bad, indifferent? Have you had them? As always, really appreciate you being here. We will be back same time, same place next week. We've got a great episode for you. Thank you to everybody who leaves the comments, especially those of you who have been sharing the Tank Talk podcast videos via Facebook or with your friends. Really appreciate that. That's how this grows. It really grows because of you and appreciate all that support. It's the easiest, freest thing you can do is just to share these videos with friends and on the groups that you're part of. Thanks again for being here. We'll see you next week.